Did you like the Negroni? I thought you were making something with the gin. Kennedy. Hello? Sorry. helps if I unmute. How about that? Can people hear this now? Yes. Yes. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So our first order of business tonight is the presentation um, by Carol Contend about the reopening. Before we start that presentation, I'd like to make a few comments. I want to make sure that everybody watching this meeting understands that the school committee only has certain controls, including policy and budget. And those are the types of things that we vote on and that we have oversight, direct oversight over. We have never, and we will never, vote on the day-to-day -day operations of the school unless there are policy or budget or other implications that we have control over. So the presentation you're going to hear tonight and the things that we are going to vote on tonight are policy and budget associated issue items, issues and items. We're talking about big picture logistics, big picture planning, overall how we're going to offer plans, what plans we're going to offer, the choices that families have. You're not going to hear tonight the exact details of how an in-person plan will work. You will hear some of those details, but not all of them. You will also hear the overall structure of remote, remote education and learning, but not the details. Those are being worked out at a school level. They continually change based on guidance from the Department of Education, the state, the governor, the the health departments, everybody. So those are being worked on constantly by the task force, by administration and staff, and are being drilled down at the school level. As we know, each school is different, not just in the nature of who attends that school, but the physical layout of the building, the capacity of the building, the types of classes that need to be taught, staffing, everything has to be catered the particular school and the students. So you're not going to hear all of that tonight. And I think a lot of people are participating tonight because they want to hear those details. They will be forthcoming. We're putting together this plan that gets submitted to the state. After that, we are going to have parent forums. It may not be next week as we had hoped. We are still working out scheduling for all the schools. It may be the week after, but there will be a district-wide question and answer forum and then school-specific question and answer forum to go through those details. Because we know a lot of parents, and this is reflected in the survey results, unfortunately, we only heard back from, I think Carol will tell us, probably about 50% of our families responded to the survey about the opening. We know families were reluctant to fill out that survey until they knew what in-person would look like or what remote would look like. So we'll get that information out as soon as it's ready, which will be 
very soon. And then we hope that everybody will redo their survey or take it if they haven't. And we will send out a text and an email when we need those numbers by so that we can finalize the plans for the fall. What we're not voting tonight or looking at tonight is exactly how things are going to look for everyone on the first day of school. And that would be an unrealist, unrealistic expectation at this point based on how quickly things change and all the pieces that are So then, moving out to the community with the information possible. And that does not mean, as far as I'm concerned, releasing information little by little, piecemeal every day, especially when it's changing. As soon as we have what we believe as the task force and administration and all their building principles and everybody involved is the best plan possible with as many details as we can put in there, it will be presented to everyone with plenty of time to make your decision about whether or not you're sending your kids in person or remote learning or as we will find out, some of our students will have a hybrid model. So please understand we can't get into that level of detail tonight. And that is not what this school committee votes on or approves or disapproves. We will have public comment later, but right now we're going to hear our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we want to, um, let's see if this is gonna work, hopefully. The first piece that I'd like to share with you is um, earlier today, uh, Ken and I were on a call with the Commissioner of Education. Again, these are happening pretty much weekly, sometimes twice a week, um, just for more information. As people know, um, on July 27th, I believe it was, was the time that we got information about the kind of detail um, that we needed for the final plans. The Commissioner has extended the deadline for turning in the final plans. Uh, to the 17th of August, because again, we are, um, every district across the Commonwealth is struggling to get everything done as fast as it needs to get done. So today when we met with the commissioner, one of the first things that he shared was this information from John Hopkins Coronavirus Research Center. And one of the things that he wanted us to see was that at least right now, Massachusetts is in a pretty good place. And one of the things that we know is um, nationwide, uh, there's an association of educators called the National Education Association. And one of the guidelines that they've put out is that 5% is a good threshold and good metric for helping us to decide whether or not um, returning to in-person school is a good thing. And you can see from here, Massachusetts is in the green and in my next slide, I'll give you a little bit more detail on that. Uh, as was in your report, you see that Barnstable County as of August 5th had 1,778 cases uh, and 157 deaths. Now our year round population as it was in uh, 2019 was a, almost 213,000 people on Cape Cod. So as you can see from the statistics down below, January 1st this year to July 29th, how our two towns fared in comparison to the 5% and Massachusetts as a whole, how we have compared. So part of the, the concern that the commissioner and others in education have is that by the time we go back to school, our kids will have been out of school for six months. And although we absolutely want to keep everybody safe, and that is, and I'll say it over and over again, the number one concern and um, detail that Ken and I and many people internally have been working on for months now, how to come back safely. So, We'll give you a little more about that in a little while, but what we know is there's way more to school than just the safety concerns um, and way more to school than just mere education. As people know, uh, our Dolphin drive-through has um, 
allowed us to continue to give our students uh, and families for our students breakfast and lunch on a daily basis. And I think we're approaching close to 300,000 meals that have been served. Um, a lot of people have lost their jobs during this time. And um, fortunately, the USDA allowed this program to continue all through the summer. And uh, we were in a good position to do it. And I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Rooney Powers and all of the food service staff for an amazing job uh, through all kinds of rainy weather, hot weather, no matter what, they were out there uh, making sure that our kids could eat. So that's just one example of the many things that schools do. Um, I think a lot of people have seen this, but I, it's a short video. I'd like to play it just one more time in case anyone in the public has not seen it. I know we have some concerned senior citizens that often join us in what we are looking at. And I think this will be very helpful for people to see this. can't see the video. Carol, we're not seeing the video. Carol, can you yeah. hear us? We can't see the video. Okay, hang on. Oh, wait a minute. Carol, can you restart it? I still can't hear anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about the, uh, the dilemma there. I, uh, I think we can all see we're all learning new things. So let me get back to the other screen share. And of course, it's not going to let me start where I left off. Well, 
Okay, turning it over to Mr. Jinks. Good evening, everyone. And uh, if anyone wonders, yes, we are appropriately physically distanced. The room was set up with that way. I've grown accustomed to my late uh, measure and measuring tool these days because that's the new reality. And part of that physical distancing is we can go into great detail about that, but that's really the core of most of the, uh, the challenges we're facing, whether it's how many students ride a bus, how many students fit into a classroom. We've been good about wearing masks, so we'll go from there. But I wanted to assure everyone that you see some of us with masks, some of us without, we're appropriately distanced, and so people, everyone's following that. How did we get to the plan we have today? Our administrative team, like teams throughout Massachusetts and the country, knew we had to put together a plan. But what did we want to base that on? What were the underpinnings? Simple. Get input from large numbers of people. And I know inevitably there's probably never enough input for some folks, but we've got to get input from various people. Continue to get input. We've had task force with six meetings, lots of emails, and then put the plan together. And if we follow the guidelines by the CDC, state and local boards of health commissioner always focusing as the superintendent pointed out on student and staff safety if we put the right resources together with the right plan if we recognize and take care of social emotional learning because people sometimes keep going why do you want students in school and for some people that may seem a very obvious they need to be there other people are saying well describe what why and let's work through that and that's how, in a sense, we drove the plan forward. Our goal was to create a plan, as asked for and called for by the commissioner, to create an opportunity for in-school, in-person instruction for as many students as possible. And that doesn't exclude those who do not wish to come on site, and it doesn't exclude hybrids. So that's our commitment to action. It's kind of how we arrived at the plan we arrived at. And what kinds of things have we been doing as we're getting ready for that plan? You can see that list of critical health and safety precautions. Uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. New set of initials. We can't hear anything. Uh, all kinds of non-touch, uh, 20 non-touch thermometers, three for each school, plexi shields uh, for locations. In short, like other places, but we've been diligent. We could, have Ken, could you go back and read that page again? We didn't hear we didn't any of that. that. Excuse me, Ken. People were having trouble hearing. And uh, it seemed like it was because maybe I wasn't muted. So would you go back to maybe just go back if, if it's okay with the committee? Just go back a little bit. Hey, let me backtrack a little. We were having a challenge with the sound. So how did we arrive at making the plan we made? Uh, we took input from a variety of stakeholders. We used the guidance from the CDC, the DPSE, the commissioner, local boards of health. We've always been focused on staff and student safety, allocate appropriate resources, looking at what we have and how do we use it to give us the best opportunity for students. We were flexible, we constantly evolving as new guidance comes up. Uh, we ended the commissioner's call today with, by the way, I'll send some more guidance out this evening, I believe, to expect some of that. And we wanted to develop a plan, realizing students have not been in school for six months. That's a lifetime for some of our students, and we can do it safely. So we wanted to put together a plan that was safe. There's no audio. Critical health and safety precautions. 
again, guided by what should be expected to be purchased. The districts we've already in our stockpile, so we're not sweating September. 72,000 masks, 3,500 shields, the gowns and gloves and specialty equipment for the programs that need them, hand sanitizer, again, we'll be a gallon for the pump in every office and every classroom when we start, non touch thermometers for nurses, plexi shields in select locations. We're in pretty good shape for September and the first six to 12 weeks, however that looks, and we already have follow-on orders in place. The facility cleaning and disinfecting. In a sense, we've gotten a great head start on summer cleaning this year, if you think about it, because it really started much earlier. Some of the rooms are probably more sparkly than they've been in quite some time. We've worked with the partner of solutions, our vendors for cleaning. They've already done retraining. We have eight disinfecting spray units. They're doing the finalizing the summer work and they'll be done in the next five to eight with summer work, summer clean. And then the whole full disinfecting regimen starts again. Right now, you're in an office that's disinfected at night because there were people. Uh, in other areas, if they're moving some furniture around the classroom and no one's going to go in there, that's not necessarily going to be disinfected. But we're gearing up so that when the season begins, if you will, the regular cleaning will take place during the day with higher frequency. There'll probably be additional staff, as you might imagine, to ensure throughout the day we're cycling through restrooms and getting all the high touch areas more. I feel we're in a good place with the company. They're doing some retraining. We have the solutions we need, all EPA approved, to address making sure we can say the schools, the classrooms, the buildings, they're safe. HVAC system, we have over 520 filters. All new filters are going in in the next couple of weeks because we usually stop in here with all new filters anyway. This year, of course, we're making extra sure. The district uh, may or may not realize we have uh, a subcontractor, a vendor, a uh, specialist, HVAC specialist from e and &E, the largest independent HVAC specialist company, HVAC specialist company in New England. And they work with us constantly, regularly. This is not a recent ad to make sure the system works effectively, proper air circulation. If it's X amount of times, all the air in the classroom is going to be turned over to the events. They work with us as specialists in repairs as needed, and working with our systems to ensure that airflow. Uh, this summer, every window has been looked at. There are windows that are problematic or either you know, a slight problem with the hinge or missing the crank. Those have been addressed. So we can always open the windows whenever possible during the school year for maximum airflow. Finally, creating cohorts, groups, traveling groups. Of uh, common groups, whether it's 20 some odd students on the bus or eight kids in the classroom, in physical distancing throughout the building. I know I've been elaborating, but I want to take a few extra minutes to kind of assure people we are following the guidance and we have the people and the practices in place to take care of. Lost you again. Three four pictures just give you sample versions of some classrooms that are appropriately distanced. Uh, that first one right there, again, maintaining the six feet. Uh, other places, other countries, American uh, Pediatric Group, I believe, have said three feet with a mask is the minimum, six feet in an ideal situation. Uh, so we've uh, gone with the six feet, and you can see what that looks like in one classroom. Look at the next one. That's a work in progress because the back two tables, you know, are too close to the wall. But we we're just working through spacing to get that visual for everyone. So you can use traps and still get those visuals. A slightly different angle in that third picture of that uh, classroom. And then another classroom down below. And you can see what happens is the vast majority of our classrooms in the district, eight at the high school in a classroom. That's what you can fit. So about 12 to 13, 14, but often eight to probably 12 is the most common. Eight at the high school, just about everywhere else, at least 12, if not 14, because you have to maintain proper distance, give the teacher the area they want. 
And later when we talk about some practical things, in a way, that's why K through seven could open, because we could create enough spaces to hold all those students. Whereas early education, and particularly the high school, you couldn't put everybody in under these conditions right now. So that's why there'll have to be some kind of hybrid. Thank you, Ken. So we shared this at the last school committee meeting last Thursday. Um, it's the continuum that the commissioner has given us of fall reopening models. Ideally, we'd be in the green and just returning without any restrictions, but the virus has not allowed for that yet. So we had to consider in the feasibility phase, the in-person learning with new safety requirements a hybrid model where students could learn both in person and remotely and remote learning. The interesting part of all of this is that remote learning actually runs across all three because in each case, we're required to allow parents to choose remote learning if that's what they want. Um, I'm going to uh, just go to the next slide because that kind of plays it out. This is what we've learned. We can achieve the physical distance requirements of, for all students in K to seven. In preschool and grades eight through 12, we'll have to use a hybrid model to achieve the physical distance requirements. That means that we can't fit all 900 students into the high school at the same time and maintain physical distance requirements as we stated earlier. So we have to move those groups to a hybrid model, which means that some days there'll be children in school present, and there'll be other kids learning at home remotely. So one of the things that um, the commissioner has made very clear to us is that our vulnerable populations, and by that we mean students who might be um, in specialized um, special education programs or our English learners, uh, we're encouraged to see if there's a way that we can fit them in every day. So while it sounds like a 50-50, it's not exactly a 50-50 because we have some vulnerable populations that if their parents choose, we'd have to have them in every single day. Um, we are working on it, it's not resolved yet, but we also know that sometimes um, parents of our um, high school students would like them to actually go to school every day for a variety of reasons. And um, we're, what we're trying to achieve is sort of this, what I call remote in-person model. So where kids are actually physically at the school, they might be in a room with a, a larger number of people, uh, all appropriately social distanced, but actually be learning remotely because it's not their real in-person day. Um, Chairman Landers mentioned about the, um, the survey results and um, it's correct, we've only heard from about 50% of our folks, but one of the things that we know is it's hard to make a decision when you don't have all the information and we really understand that. Um, and so that's why we really have to work on the 100% remote uh, as soon as possible, as well as what will it look like for our high school kids when they're in a hybrid and some of the time they're in remote. Um, you can see here, um, we do have in pre-K to seven, a large number, even though it's probably a quarter of our kids, not even, maybe a little less, but 499 people want in person and still a 370 uh, undecided while 192 are saying, yep, we're gonna, we're gonna choose remote. Also with the high school, something similar, um, Again, fewer numbers for the remote, in-person and hybrid, if you added those together, meaning that people don't mind if their kids come to school, that's a good, good solid number. And then still 114 undecided. In addition to that, we have um, surveyed our staff. Um, I'm pleased to say that our, our staff was very responsive. We're probably missing about 70-ish people but um, this was a really good response rate and um, we appreciate that um, people responded to our survey. So what we're doing next is um, 
at the building level, at the school level, principals are going to, they're looking through their data right now in terms of their students and who responded, who didn't respond yet, uh, trying to get some sense of what's happening. So the next thing that'll happen is families will get a message from the school saying, hey, we haven't heard with, from you about the survey. Um, could you give us one more chance and try to do with the survey? After a few days of that, probably by early next week, we will start calling just so that people can have conversations and tell us, you know, uh, what they're worried about or why they didn't, you know, maybe they just didn't have the technology, maybe they didn't get the email. There are all kinds of reasons why people might not have seen it. Maybe they're just not checking their email in the summer. Okay. So this is really, at this point, our recommendation is that we offer, I mean that we require everyone to come, we offer full in-person services for our K-7 to families that wish it. We offer a hybrid model for our eight through 12, grades eight through 12 and preschool students for any families that wish that. We can't offer a full in-person and a hybrid and a remote. It's, it's not going to work. And so my question would be, if you like the hybrid, that means that you're okay with your child coming to school. I can't guarantee that on the day that your child comes via hybrid, that there are no germs in the air. So what we're trying to do is, as close as we can, prevent the germs every day with the mask wearing, with the distancing, with the other pieces that will be in place so that the students can effectively learn in person. Um, we know that kids need movement breaks, they need mask breaks, all of those kinds of things. So those are all like the granular details that each school has to work out. How are we going to do that? What will it look like within our schedule? And it still attend to the really important piece. So this would be our recommendation. I'm not gonna ask the committee to vote yet, but you will see here also that we realize that we have not completed our collective bargaining with our bargaining units. So it, it, this is also subject to any collective bargaining obligations that we might have. And with the understanding that the situation is fluid and changes to the plan can and will be made as needed based on health data. One of the things that's really hurting us a lot is that when you turn on the TV and you see some school in another state, say Georgia, um, where all the kids are roaming around the halls, not socially distanced, no masks on, and then they have an outbreak. And people are like, oh my God, look what's happening. And that's not our model. It never will be our model. Um, one of the things that I will bring to the committee in a next meeting, most likely we received today, uh, uh, an idea for a policy from the MASC on mask wearing. We have to have a policy. It'll be important. If you're not going to wear a mask, you can't be here. That has to be a rule. We can't, we can't play around with this. So health and safety has to come first all the way through. So that's very important. Just wanna give a couple of shout outs for some family supports. And I know I have to do a new share now. So let me pull this up. This is just one thing that was in the report. Just give you a quick picture of it if uh, you don't mind. Um, new share, let's see, any new tricks? There we go. So this is from Connecticut Children's Hospital, I think. Um, but what I liked about it, and uh, it was shared with us uh, through the Department of Ed, um, all kinds of ways for different age groups and parents to look and see if you have a five to 12 year old helping them to understand, if you have a 13 to 18 year old. So there are a lot of really good, um, there are a lot of really good ways for parents to um, have the opportunity to work with their children at home uh, as far as all of the um, getting used to new routines and so on and so forth. 
So I'll just share one more. It's 55 seconds. Hope you don't mind. It's just a short little video was in the packet in the in the report, but there's a lot of really good stuff around. And one of the things that I think that our educators are really good at is understanding the developmental levels of our children. And I know if I was back in my first grade classroom, what I would be doing um, with my kids when they came to school. And so these little pieces really help will really help our, our students and parents, parents can also do at home. Oops. Of course. All right. Can't get it to turn. Oh, wait. Share and turn it off. That's supposed to stop. Okay, enough of that. I guess it's going back to you, Ken. In fact, received quite a few questions about this uh, particular element of the policy. And the, the idea being, I pick option A, if you will, and then I want to switch, and now I want to come back to school in the schools where everybody can come on site. And the DESC, their guidance was you can have a delay because of the situation, but you want to make sure within three or four weeks you get people placed. And the question is, well, why can't they just come back within a day or two? And it's about the physical realities. If you have eight seats in the classroom, it's not as easy as it sounds suddenly when, say, 20 or 30 students over a course of two weeks want to come in. It might be better to create a new co cohort, get that set up, but not take the three weeks. But the idea being, we've again used every available space, say for instance, at a school like Station Ave, and every spot's assigned. And so if people want to come back, okay, you want to work that out, is there capacity on the buses? Do you have everything there? There might be a lag. And so that's why we wanted to have the language that would Give us that lag depending on the situation. Because hypothetically, say there's not a class in session and, and places get reassigned from staffing, and then they need to recreate a session. That might take time. So that's the genesis of why having a three, say, week delay or so, if needed, because people want to change the plan, makes it work for us. Otherwise, we may not have the capacity to just say, oh, come in tomorrow. If you look at the PD to get everyone ready, one of the key elements of uh, everybody concerned about how things look in September 
when we return is, is there enough training and enough preparation and teachers are comfortable with the health protocols, teachers, teaching assistants, administrators, all the health elements, but as well as this will be a more intense educational experience if we're doing remote with some people. And we know that has to be. And there's new guidance about that, about grades would count and some of the expectations. And so normally, we all know 180 days in the Commonwealth, the commissioner agreed with the teachers, the state MTA and NEA groups, 170 day school year, student year for students. You can see the 10 days, so we do this effectively when we start rolling. And then you'll be uh, asked to vote on the calendar later, starting the school year in September, as you see, no later than September 16th. And the calendar recommendation, based on conversations with a variety of folks and discussions with our the representation from bargaining units, that September 16th date with 12 preparation days puts us in a place where everyone should feel confident that they've been trained, everything is ready, whether a student's coming into an instructional space or getting remote lessons at home, we're providing a quality education. And so those are the professional development elements. And as you might imagine, there'll be a whole list we'll be able to bring forward of what that looks like. Chairman Landers earlier mentioned all those individual school details and without going excessively into that, anything from, so how many minutes per week in this session or how, what's the precise breakdown classes this year, the arrival of dismissal, how many doors are they using, who's monitoring, transitions we all know always are not going to look the way they used to in terms of how students pass, maybe even the directions that pass them. There's a whole list of steps that have to be resolved in school. The principals and their advisors and other on their teams soliciting feedback from everybody. They're coming together with their final plans for what does that look like, the traffic flow, eating. Is that in multiple areas? Probably. What does that look like? How do you work that? And everybody has to adjust to if we're doing six foot distancing, whether you're going into the school building or dismissing times, all kinds of dominoes. So all kinds of factors there. And those will be coming forward in greater detail as well. And quite frankly, until we had a better handle on the parent survey numbers, it was hard to design those elements based on the capacity of the buildings. I think this was a uh, I'm gonna say nightmare, but that's not right. the area of focus, the thing that maybe makes me wake up occasionally at night is 32 buses that hold 736 students under the new regs in each tier requiring about 900 students. Now, in a way, as everyone knows, the reality as a practice here with the practical pieces, most of us realize not every student, even in a regular year, rides a bus. So right now, with the current percentages that we have, working with the bus company, we feel we're in a pretty good place actually to be able to get each tier to where they need to go. We might be coming back once we get some final numbers again about, if we will add one bus, our special education buses. If you think about it, usually carry maybe 12 to 14 students, four. So we'll use one larger bus though, that can carry 23 with an assistant to pick up some of the students who that's part of their education plan, but there's no special criteria about perhaps a medical situation or uh, strapping uh, helping the students in the site. So right now we're working through the list. Uh, all those parents who have said, yes, I'm not going to take the bus. I appreciate you're getting back to us right away because we're already starting some of the route planning now because we have the numbers. So if I can make any plea to any family at home who has yet to fill in the survey, even if you're not sure about the other things, if you wanted to call your school principal or the school office and say, by the way, I know I'm not gonna be riding the bus, whatever I'm doing, that would be appreciated so we can get those things taken care of. However, the number of uh, 
areas that still have questions. Athletic associations are still looking at September 14th in theory as the beginning of practices and, and such. Clubs and activities, how do you handle after school? We all know the practical reality. We're following one set of rules all day from 7 in the morning to about 3 and 2 30 in the afternoon. What do those rules look like? And are you using the same rules after school for those programs? And before and after school care, we've done some uh, work with us of some of our operations. We've learned a great deal. And again, they're labor intensive, so we might be able to offer those programs, but it's a little too early for us to make a commitment to the resources personnel and we know many parents depend on those kinds of programs we just need a little more information in the next week or two to be able to say this is what we can or can't do and again in the case of sports clearly multiple outside agencies are involved in that decision also as part of the report you saw in appendix b and this is one of the things that people worry about the most what's going to happen if and in Appendix B, you can see page after page after page. If there's a, a staff member that gets uh, sick, what you do. If there's a child that gets sick, what you do. If they're sick at home, if they're sick at school and all those kinds of things. Um, we have an amazing nurse leader in this district working with an amazing team of nurses, school nurses. And they've been talking all over the summer and um, our nurse leader has been with us every step of the way. As everybody knows, we did open a small program for some summer care and um, some of our extended school year students. I must say that uh, the shout out goes to those folks who are working those programs. They're doing amazing work. As you may recall, last week was extremely hot, um, but they soldiered on. And um, honestly, the kids are having a great time. They're enjoying being together. Yes, they're socially distant all the time. They're wearing masks all the time. And surprisingly, the students have adjusted to it a lot quicker than we do as adults. Um, or maybe that's not surprising to some of us who know how kids are. Um, but interestingly, they come in those cases, in most cases, they're coming from their parents' cars. They come right in. They know they go right to the sink and wash their hands. Um, there were some first graders playing the other day and they had their masks on. They were a little bit closer together than the six feet. And so uh, they were trying to give the kids a mask break and the, the uh, person with them said, you know, you could take off your mask, but you have to move further apart. They said, that's okay, we'll just leave the masks on. We'd like to be closer together. That's out of the mouths of six-year-olds. So um, we are asking parents to be our partners in this, but it isn't that we think that we want them to just do the work at home and we won't do anything at school. Of course we will. We're gonna work with our kids. You saw uh, in the report about the PBIS teams. I think we had the underpinning of PBIS has always been that if our students could do what we expect of them, they would do it. And if they're not doing what we expect, we're, a we're an educational institution. It's our job to teach them what we expect and teach them what to do. So um, I thank the committee for their attention and those at home for their attention and um, we'll uh, turn it over for questions and input from however you want to handle it, Madam Chair. So we can either take, well, what I would suggest is if anybody on the committee has very specific questions right now for Carol, based on the- What are you making for dinner? Spaghetti. With, uh, 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 yeah. yourself, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to mute everyone. Unless you're bringing your spaghetti here for all of us. <laughs> um, so if you have specific questions right now for Carol, please, you know, feel free so that you're clear on, you know, the further discussion. It's later in the meeting after the public comment that we will address our actual item that we have to approve tonight and we can continue the discussion then. So anyone has questions for please, Brian Thomas. Uh, the camera moment is so much camera. And you mentioned we had three to twelve weeks worth of PPE. Is that right? Days. Most of it we have the initial twelve weeks. You know, the state has a, a grid. That's how we came up with seventy-two thousand masks. So that's like early December. Yes. 
And then my other question is, um, with regards to the high school, are we just using the classrooms or are we considering um, gym space, auditorium space, or even any of that space? Or just just classroom space. Some alternative spaces have already been used, and without going into excruciating detail, and you got the gap with the usual gap, you can't use the food, you can eat it, and all that. Yes, they, they were outside the box. Anyone else on the committee? Just quickly, uh, just quickly to, to the superintendent. Um, with the surveys, because we only have half of them back, could some of that be uh, with the K through seven in not offering a, a hybrid? You know, some someone might have uh, put undecided um, down when they didn't have another option. Um, but then the people who the fifty percent that haven't responded yet. That could change for the benefit of everything. In other words, just like you said about the uh, people who are not going to take the bus. If those people respond and we get it, it could make our numbers work out better for, for all kinds of things. And that could be uh, for, for teachers, and it could be for uh, the bus routes, and it could be for remote learning. And so it, my, my main question is though, that, that uh, how does that survey change you know, with the, as it continues to change and we get updated, we could end up changing a lot of different things. Here. I don't think that the overall plan ideas will change because some of that has to do specifically with um, space availability in the, in the schools. So we know with the space availability that we have, we really could. If every child wanted in K to seven to come back in person, we could socially distance them six feet apart, provide them with their educational services in person. The remote model for all levels, we um, ha can have that available uh, for every level as well. We know that we cannot put all of our high school kids into the high school all at once and keep them socially distanced. So those that takes that off the table because you can't do it based on everything that the commissioner has said and all the health guidelines. You can't do it unless you can properly distance them. So that's what takes that off the table. So then you're ending up with the high school. You could, your only choices are hybrid, or full full remote, or in that one, you know, and we don't know how many yet we could fit in. We're still experimenting with that, and some of it has to do with Kent, like what Brian asked Ken about the number of um, places that we might have to use. Like if we have to use a gym to put uh, desks so the kids can be socially distant for lunch because we can't fit them all in the cafeteria, then we don't have that gym space for a classroom space. So. It's that kind of really level of detail. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Right, okay. okay, let's see if I can work through this because I have several questions. Um, so let's go to the first one, maybe easy. Ken, um, as far as busing is concerned, and we don't have a policy on this, and I'm sitting here trying to figure out how are you going to put certain number of students on a day to day basis going to say as your baker, then all of a sudden someone says, well, I'm going to send my student to school starting the third week. Does the school committee need a policy that says you need to opt into busing or notify the district so that you get a heads up and a bus driver doesn't get five extra students on a given day and all of a sudden is forced in a bad, into a bad position. Um, I, I know because we get regional money, we get money from the Commonwealth for our regional district, we can't charge a fee. But I think everybody knows they've been on this committee long enough. One of the biggest headaches that we see as we open up schools is 
all of a sudden, you know, Johnny didn't notify Ken that, you know, the district that he was going to take the bus. And, you know, we didn't, there wasn't a stop allocated for him. So I think we need to be able to give you some tools to set bus routes ahead of time. And are we allowed to do that? I would gladly draft a document. And in one of the, the we've had two meetings a week. At the okay. Please, thank you. I think yeah, people at home would be about it. Thank you. Gladly draft something to present to the group. One of the things we've had two meetings about buses uh, in the last two weeks from the Department of Ed because everybody's working through these challenges. And one of the pieces that they keep reminding us most school systems, the reimbursement is only for the students who live more than 1.5 miles away. So most school systems, including us, often have a policy where we don't expect the younger students, say K and five to go over that 1.5 miles. So there's room to say, we have some more group stops. We need advanced notification if you want to add a bus route. Those pieces, because that could be the difference. 15 new students could be the difference between us having to go. Uh, there needs to be a second tier of buses to one school or something, and then with all the trips. That would be great. So that's just a thought, and I think that's something that the administrative team should work on. Um, with in-person schools, does school day, does the time for students being in the building change because we might not be able to have gym or we might not be able to have um, other other classes that we more normally might have if we figured that piece out? Or is it going to be a regular school day? I think we're required to give a regular school day. I, we haven't really worked through that. The only thing that would be you know, there could be some creative alternatives, shall I say, if we needed to, but we haven't actually gone there yet. I mean, there could be some creative alternatives where, say, for example, since you mentioned PE, I think of the younger kids, um, it could be possible that um, they get that part remotely somehow, like they get their art class, you know, they take the little thing, bag of stuff home and, or maybe in the morning before they get to school that the art teacher or somebody works with them on online. But we haven't really, most of the time, mostly what we're thinking is all in means all in. Um, we're not gonna be serving lunch in the cafeteria, right? The options for lunch, they originally started with O and we're one of the schools that are looking serious, school system seriously at having hot lunch available. And there's ways to do it. The most recent advisory actually from the DESC you know, was modified and, and talks about, well, if you have a model that has three or four locations where people can have lunch, you could actually do more than sandwiches and can do that, but you just have to maintain the distance. And so depending on the size of the school, uh, without getting too much detail, people often know about like breakfast, grab and go. If you use three entrances, have three peanuts. The lunch, food services would like to offer hot food because they feel that just going on forever with sandwiches. Now they know there's all kinds of criteria and that's why everybody's working through the plans. And then how do you cycle your lunches? Those things are all doable if you have the space and you work your times a little differently. Um, I'd like to address some of our high need, high need students, especially the ones that go to the high school. And is it possible because they get, I don't want to call it shuttle service, but they get pretty personal service. So we use some of our other buildings for some of those students to make sure that they are in school five days a week if their parents, guardians want them to be in the school. I think that's something that if, if we have one school that has space, why not just move that student there for a little while? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a, a possibility, but honestly, um, based on what we're doing this summer, we can fit the kids in their current home schools. I'm concerned about subs. You know, uh, if, if we have teachers who opt out and don't want to, you know, they could be in a high risk group and not want to be in a, in a fully physical school, um, 
how can we work with them to possibly work remotely? If not, are we going to have enough subs? And I'm concerned about subs because most of our subs are what? In the high need group, high high, high risk group. group, high risk group. So um, I think we have to look at our staff positions and how we can backfill some of those to keep you know people that were already on our payrolls that could we could put into a classroom fairly easily. Uh, and I think that's something important. Um, listen, this is never easy. And what we're going through, and, and it could, I think it's been said several times earlier, this could change tomorrow, you know? Um, but I think we really need to, to button ourselves up. Um, I'd also like to think if we have to go remote, I think we should look at having our staff in the buildings um, while teaching remote. Uh, and I think that's something that is, is reasonably expected. The buildings will be clean. Teacher could be in his or her own classroom and teach remote to the students who are at home, even if it was just the teacher in the classroom. And I think that's something to consider as well. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Joe, no, 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 I do want to say, Brian, I want to reassure you and everybody that I think almost, I think everything that everyone has brought up so far are things that we are discussing in the task force. So, you know, it's a group of 50 people and from every building and every population. So it's really, you know, we're right there with you. You know, you should definitely consider being one of them. So absolutely. And I just think it's important for those, you know, the people that are home, we have 200 people, whatever it is. And, and you know, certainly there's a certain segment that are tuning in, but I also think more, we owe it to the parents to really drill down and make them feel comfortable, whether they're remote learning or physically in the buildings. Absolutely. Um, I, I agree with Brian on a lot of points. And you're right, Jenny, the task force is pretty much um, tackled every scenario, drill down to it. I have a couple of questions also. Um, just in the in the in-person model for the K through seven grades, um, we talked a little bit about the um, same group of students in each of the classes throughout the day. You know, we'll have their art classes, we'll have their minimized class discussions. So I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit on that or I think I want to detail when those school dependent, um, every school dependent. Well, I think Ken can give you all the requirements, and then I'll maybe I'll just give a little color commentary on that. Yeah, uh, in short, exactly. I think everybody has this vision of how does that look. You know, we even looked at, right, you couldn't make a class group ride a specific bus, you know, full of cohort. But if I say that uh, that dozen students arrived at school, different buses, they go in, they're in that room, and whatever they do within reason is pretty much together for the remainder of the day, including recess, including lunch, and all that. And then they head home. I, I know the superintendent probably can elaborate what that looks like specifically with the younger models. So that is um, true. We would have the teacher, you know, like if you're in third grade, you're going to have your same teacher all day. It could be that um, because remember now our class sizes are small, so it could be that um, two uh, classes of eight or 10 or 12 are side by side and one teacher in in one with one group of students is really, a, you know, has had years of teaching reading experience and is really at the top of their game in terms of that somebody else next door with the other 12 kids has been really uh, in tune to the math program, really great at it. Those folks might swap off, like I'll teach the math to both groups. That could happen uh, in a lot of cases all the way up through fifth grade. Um, in the other, uh, the other grades, um, those students are used to moving from class to class, but instead the teachers will push in. So there's less um, chance of spreading anything should that happen? And um, in addition to that, though, um, I know it's not, you know, when I think of that and I think about, you know, if I had a little kid right now, how would that feel? Um, that feels like, oh my God, are they ever going to walk around? Are they ever going to move? And things like that. I would say yes. 
And that's an important piece because kids do need movement breaks. We were talking about just going to get your lunch is a thing to uh, get you up out of your seat and get you moving. The other thing is, <clears throat> one of the things I used to do when I was teaching first grade is kids would stand up behind their chairs. You're still socially distant now because your chair is right at your little trap table or whatever. And we would do some things while we were counting or whatever, you know, touch our toes or, you know, do some uh, crossing the midline with the windmills or whatever it might be. So you're going to, um, we also are gonna encourage um, our teachers to take classes outside if it's a nice day. Um, they don't have to just sit right in the classroom. All of our kids will have iPads. They can take those iPads and go outside. They can take a little notebook and go outside. We're working really hard on thinking about like what kind of tools do the kids need so they could have them right in their desk. In the old days, you know, you'd have the um, tray for the scissors over here. And when the teacher said, okay, you know, everybody get your scissors, everybody swarmed up to the tray and grabbed their scissors. Can't do that now. So we have to keep it at their desk um, because that's, that'll be their things and they touched it and no one else did. Um, so there are a lot of those kinds of things that we're thinking about and making orders, as Ken said, but it's really important that people understand that it's not going to be just the kids sitting at their tables all day long and never getting a chance to get up and move around. That's going to be super important. Thank, thank you, Trevor. Um, in the, uh, the hybrid model, um, the high school, we talked about you know, part of it being remote. You know, when we started this in March, it was it went right to a moment. You guys you know, used the phrase a hundred times, you know, find the place to build it. So you guys, you know, district had to put together a remote model which would work okay, but you know that's a piece of serial on it. a little bit different, a little bit more accountable um, so as far as attendance is concerned, as far as tuition is concerned, you can make it make the remote Um, I'll say I certainly appreciate the patience of the community last spring. You're right. We never had to do anything like that before in our lives. And I think people did as good a job as they probably could have with what we had to work with. But it's really clear now that if you're in remote learning, what happened last spring is not going to be good enough. So um, we're working uh, with our curriculum directors and other folks to figure out what those 12 days will look like in terms of helping our teachers um, gain new skills, especially for remote learning. Because in addition to the fact that some kids might be out in remote and some kids might be in school, if things did go south, as they say, um, with the virus and we all had to go suddenly to remote, we would not want it to be what it was last year. And so part of the really good pieces that I think we have in place is that whether our kids are in school or whether they're home, they'll, you know, they're gonna have their iPads and we're gonna teach them some new things on the iPads to help them if we were, did have to be in remote while they're in school. And not only that, we are also, going to pay attention to the fact that we don't want really little kids on their screens all day long. So it's the balancing act between how do you deliver educational services when the students aren't in front of you, yet at the same time, be really clear about what's important for young children. Very tough. If they have an 80 30 class or whatever it is, you know, they're, they're going to be they're there and present and ready to learn. Um, you know, if you get them together, I guess that's another matter. Um, but I think that's that is, that's important. That's important to My last question is um, you know, we talk about all these protocols and things like that that have to happen. All this costs money. And do we have any idea about you know, funding? Uh, we're going to have to go back. I don't know. I mean, 
question. I don't know. I'm not asking for an answer. I'm just saying, is there a projection of what you know, what cost, how we're going to pay for it? Our initial number for the funding was five ninety one five hundred ninety one thousand dollars for COVID pandemic related expenses, whether it be staff or technology. There was a state grant, for instance, for uh, technology purposes for students because of the pandemic. We uh, applied for some of the monies we spent. Remember the power blocks and all that last spring? We'll be getting about 65000 uh, I think we'll all have a full accounting that's a lot tighter, of course, at some future meeting. At this point, I never want to say we're, oh, everything's great, but I feel we're in a good position. I don't see some any insurmountable expenses. We, uh, Chapter 70, the reason I'm being cautious is the state keeps on going, well, your budget's good till October. You, you hear that, and then they go to finalize. But even the Chapter 70 being frozen at last year, we made a joke before us. It's not what we wanted to hear, but that into that gap. But we're in a place where I'm, I'm not worried that, oh my gosh, we're spending all this money on supplies that we don't have in our budget. The careful answer, but I feel the accurate answer is so far. And hopefully, that the next wave of federal money is, I think everyone's counting that we may see are going to be more supportive because I think everyone realizes you can't look at schools and say do more, buy these things, add staff if money's don't come from the feds or frankly. Moment. If I could give one shout out to this community in our two towns, after being on a uh, Zoom, another Department of Ed, Department of Revenue Zoom today, the number of schools that are on the 112 budget because their communities didn't fund it to have town meetings right at the end of June, they're the ones who are really, really worried of the cash flow. And the committee and opportunities said, what a difference we're in simply because everybody worked that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Frank, are you going to follow up? Thank you. So, um, it just a, it's a comment regarding um, extracurriculars, sports, music. Um, you know, I, I think we're all in a pinch here waiting for. MIAA to tell us what we can and can do. Well, you know what? The MIAA doesn't oversee things in rural sports. So my idea would be to have intramural sports in cross country, golf, and put something together outside of DY and an outdoor volleyball court somehow or another to keep our students engaged and working together. And that's some of the those are that's part of the DY agenda. And I will not leave out music. You need to find a way to pull those things. You know what? We're in uncharted territory. If the MIA comes out and says you can't do this, we can still have intramural sports and pick three school districts within, you know, 20 minutes of us that will participate. And I think that's something that we should seriously look into at the high school and even at the uh, five to six and seven level. So um, I, I, we can't leave that behind. Thank you. Yeah, just a small question when you were talking about the uh, task force. Uh, I know that's not a subcommittee, um, but is there a way that we can get a, uh, a report back? I think that their brainstorming and what they're contributing uh, will help all of us. If we get that information, it will help us. To figure out a lot of these issues. And I, I trust that they're doing a great job. And I trust that that's helping you. But the more people that if we get a report back from them, not an official report, but however we can do it, uh, I, I, I don't I don't know how the, the I know it wasn't characterized as a subcommittee, so I know there's no uh, open meeting on the issues there, but uh, just I don't know how that's going. I think that the best way to report back to you from that 
task force is going to be reported from the principal because that task force using the large group setting is going to be breakout rooms by building. And all the discussion in those breakout rooms is what is going to help the principal create their plan for the school. So I think when you hear from the principals and you know, that can be clear what the task force is discussing. It's sort of a roundabout way. It just would be you try to take minutes to report out what you really need. It take more time if you were actually. Yeah, no, I didn't even understand about the breakout rooms and how, how it was developing. I mean, you know, we're spending, you know, four hours a week on that task force. So it's great. Thank you. Okay. All right. All of the other follow up questions. I'd like to stop the discussion with the committee and go to the people on the board. Absolutely. Yep. We're Thank a little you. late on public comment, but we can move to public comment now. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, would you like me to go through the chat first and get the questions from chat, or do you want to go right to the people? Um, honestly, I'm not interested in the chat. Okay. Uh, then I think that's the proper protocol for public comment. So, okay, so we have. Uh, um, if people have questions, I'm saying this is all the same as over and over again. Send an email to your principal, to the superintendent, to the admin office, the email address will be in your survey, to one of your committee members. Call your principal. Facebook and Zoom are not the best way to get information. Um, and if you have questions, they will get answered. We need to contact them first. So, with all due respect to the people who are on the Zoom and the people in the chat, we're going to move to traditional public. Okay, so I'll um, call on the people that have their hands up. Yeah, I do want to say that public comment is going to be limited to 30 minutes. And each person will be allowed to speak for no more than three minutes. Again, this is not a question. It's a period. It's up to three minutes where you can give us your comments, concerns, suggestions. And I guess for our previous we can make time to get from there. Yes. Uh, but I can use my name as well. Okay. Okay, so first up we have, I believe it's Neely Martin. Neely, can you are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Hi, my name is Kelly Martin. And Hi, I Kelly. Live, I live in Dennis and I am 11 years old. I will be in sixth grade at Mattakees this year. My mom teaches at Emmy Small. Learning this spring was not easy. I miss the interaction with my teachers, friends, and peers. I love my mom. I love my teachers and I love my friends. And the best way to keep them safe and healthy is for us to all be learning online completely remotely in September. Now I'm going to pass it over to my brother. Thank you. Hi, my name is Murphy Martin and I'm going into seventh grade at Mattakees, although not physically. I, along with lots of other people have asthma, which makes me more likely to have worse symptoms of COVID. I choose to not go to school because masks do not stop 100% of germs. And if someone in the school has COVID, other people could catch it before the original carrier experiences symptoms. I know that this may sound weird, but the longer we stay home, the quicker we can get back to school safely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have someone with a phone number or a number that's 011708. I'm not sure who that is. You can unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please. Yeah, it's Beth Verani. Um, firstly, I'd love to have those students in my class. They're so articulate. Um, I just wondered what accommodations um, will be made for high risk faculty and staff or for those caring for high risk individuals. I, di I didn't see anything in the in the district plan. There are a lot of uh, laws and rules pertaining to that. And so if um, somebody has, a, has an issue, they just need to write a letter to the superintendent. Uh, next up, we have uh, Diane Ross, please. Diane, are you there? I believe she's not here right now. Okay. 
Um, let's go to uh, Michelle Dunn, please. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Dunn. I am a fifth grade teacher at Wixon and president of the DYEA. Carol recently reported that 75% of our teaching staff could return to work in person. The survey I sent out asked how they wanted to return. Of the 50% who responded, 40% want full remote, 35% hybrid, and only 25% in person. Not because we don't miss our kids, we do. Not because remote teaching is easier because it absolutely is not. It is because our members are frightened by the increase in test positive case, uh, the increase in the number of cases and the increase in the positive test percentage on Cape and in our state. They are frightened by the mountain of unanswered questions and constantly changing medical information, including a study showing higher transmission rates among children than we previously thought. Somerville and Franklin are going remote. Bourne will be remote for eight weeks and then reassess based on data. And last night, after more than an hour of public comment and extensive discussion, Barnstable approved a cautious, phased in approach that mirrors what we have done in Massachusetts. They will return September 16th remotely for two weeks. By September 28th, when they are due to return in person, they will know whether or not the tourist season has caused a spike on Cape Cod. But they will return for half days for two weeks, because in addition to masks and social distancing, medical experts tell us to limit our exposure to people. That's why we wait in our car at our doctors and our dentists, and why we make our visits to stores brief. We have 500 students at Wixon and dozens of staff. I don't think 500 people have gathered in a building in Massachusetts for seven hours since March. We have no idea what is going to happen in that situation and our school should not be used for experimentation, which is why Barnstable will return for half days. Well, for two weeks, they will return full time on October 13th. Their superintendent also noted that this will allow for a half day of teacher planning every, two, every day for two weeks because there will be many unanswered questions and things that need to be readjusted on the fly. And that planning time will allow for that. Throughout, they will use public health benchmarks to decide if it is safe to move to the next phase and they will use remote learning every Wednesday for allow, to allow for deep cleaning. Our state has moved cautiously in phases guided by scientific data. If we required this approach to reopen stores, gyms, and restaurants, how can we justify a less stringent approach to open our schools? Every year in my role, I urge our members to consider long-term disability insurance. As I tell them, best case scenario, I will find out that I've thrown away 40 bucks a month for years because I never got sick and I never needed it. In this situation, if we as a district move cautiously, guided by science, the best case scenario is that at the end, we will be criticized for moving too slowly because nobody got sick or died. Our students, our staff, and our community deserve this measured approach. Thank you. Alice Fullen, please. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen. Thank you for recognizing me. Um, this situ horrible, horrible situation has certainly um, shown a light on one of America's dirty little secrets and that's the disparity between the haves and the have lesses. Um, because the truth of the matter, as well as our passion for our job is that parents, staff, America at large is being asked to choose between their health and a paycheck. Um, even worse, parents have to choose between that paycheck and their children's health. I, um, I'm grateful every night that I, I'm beyond that and I don't have to choose for my children. By sending us back, you're saying it's okay. You're asking staff to do something that you yourselves won't do. And that's have contact daily with hundreds of children. You're assuring parents that it's okay even though their children will sit socially distanced in one room wearing a mask for a length of time, yet they'll still be at risk. You're asking me to stand in full PPE in front of my students and tell them it will be okay. It's not okay. 
No amount of Lysol is going to save decrepit buildings. No amount of discipline is going to make children behave like adults. In closing, I'm asking you to remember that we're a community. We're supposed to take care of each other, all of us, our families, our teachers, our school committee. Take a quiet moment before you make your decisions, each and every one of you, and picture those community members that you know, that you have relationships with and you love, and decide who among them is expendable, because most certainly some of them will be. Thank you. Mrs. Woodbury, you're on mute. Oh, that's a problem. Thank you. Um, Zane Fitzgerald, please. Hi, um, thank you for a moment. Uh, I just wanted to kind of make a, a brief statement. I, I wrote a couple things down to collect my thoughts and, and I apologize for reading off piece of paper and hopefully it doesn't appear as much. Uh, so, you know, the task force, the school committee, the administration, they really made a tremendous effort here during, you know, this unpredictable, unprecedented time. Um, I am grateful and was honored to be a part of the reopening task force. And, and basically, I just wanted to voice my disagreement with the decision for K to seven to attend in person and uh, eight to 12 part time. Uh, you know, I personally have many concerns about the current plan set forward. One of my largest concern is that the plan isn't attached to public health statistics or barometers and maybe even has a phased reopening. You know, throughout the process, I felt that anecdotal evidence seemed to be provided as either fact or an implication of fact, you know, things like kids 10 or under don't get it or don't spread it, while other recent cases point to other facts disputing these ideas. And, and while those aren't certain either, I don't feel that they were shared quite as much. You know, there's undoubtedly a benefit to returning to in-person learning. However, I think the value is overshadowed by uh, the current public health concerns. I understand and agree that there are certain students in high risk populations that need to return in person to school. However, I do think it's in the best interest of all of our students to return um, to, to remote learning. Uh, I'm in, in, in eventually full time in person. I'm, I'm in favor of full remote learning to start the school year with an in person uh, option for the identified high risk children and special education students. You know, I enjoyed and appreciated the opportunity to participate in the task force. The group works super hard to do their best in an extremely difficult time, and I appreciate the effort for sure. However, it did appear though everything was approached with the focus and direction of putting the kids physically back in school and not necessarily a focus on exploring and finding finding the best solution. Um, I don't feel that there was really a true welcoming of uh, alternate paths or directions. More time could have been spent going over remote learning options with parents and teachers. While I understand why there isn't a fleshed out plan currently, it would have been wonderful to get feedback from the task force to help make those plans. Uh, you know, truthfully, it was my feeling that the kids safety wasn't the highest priority in these meetings. This may seem offensive to some and, and I'm totally not trying to offend anybody, but it appears that economic pressure, political pressure, either from constituents or government and uh, the emotional health of children, not physical, is what ended up being the driving motives for the decisions. You know, I felt in some sense that the emotional, the children's emotional needs were discussed at such greater weight than their actual safety and the, the overarching question of whether or not it's even safe to meet in person. It's not to say that, you know, uh, PPE, um, that there wasn't all the discussions about PPE and how we keep safe when we're inside of it. You know, I think one thing that everyone could be clear on is that we don't know the effects long-term of coronavirus. We have almost no clear data other than wear a mask and stay distant from each other that says anything in either direction. Uh, personally, I have two children in the district that I will not be sending to school on day to one. And, and I'm not just here to complain. I am more than happy to continue to participate in a task force capacity for remote learning in person and, and to continue to share ideas. And uh, thank you very much. Kendra Johnson. Thanks, Carol. Um, I also wrote some things down. Kendra Johnson, first grade teacher, Station Ave. 
Let me begin by acknowledging that I share the concern that everyone has regarding the social emotional well being of our students and the fact that we all want to go back to school when it's safe to do so. In school learning when it happens will look very different and not include the socialization and interactions that our students are used to. Students will not be learning how to share. They will not be engaged in center activities. They will not be playing partner learning games together. They will not be enjoying morning meeting time on the carpet. They will be six feet apart at a desk or table facing forward, wearing masks by themselves. It will not be the warm fuzzy atmosphere that students have experienced in the past. On a personal note, I fall into the high risk category. While I most likely will have the option of teaching remotely from home, no concrete guidance has been provided in terms of what that will look like this year or whether or not I'd be able to teach remotely in my current grade level. Because of this uncertainty, do I potentially teach remotely a grade or subject area out of my area of expertise, or do I put my own health at risk in order to teach the grade for which I am best equipped and most passionate about in person? It's a terrifying choice. Compound this with the fact that during last week's school committee meeting, a very confident rosy picture was painted regarding health and safety in terms of the district's readiness for reopening. While the district's success in acquiring masks, face shields, and hand sanitizer is wonderful and necessary, these items alone will not create a safe school environment. Our schools need to be properly cleaned. Pre-COVID, daily standard cleaning routines were frankly not done by custodial staff. At best, trash would be removed and our carpets cleaned. But the cleaning of classroom tables, chairs, and other surfaces never happened unless teachers did it themselves. As a result, I have serious doubts that more stringent essential sanitation protocols will be consistently carried out. Who will monitor this? And will more, more cleaning staff be hired? Too many questions remain regarding what will be cleaned and how often. Families and teachers need to feel confident that school building surfaces, as well as learning materials and safety equipment are properly disinfected every day or even multiple times a day. The safety of our students and teachers, as well as their respective families is of utmost importance. Lives are at stake, a cautious, phased in approach is necessary. Thank you. Susan Curley, please. Hi, thank you. Good evening. Uh, Kendra, you kind of stole my, uh, my points. Um, Sue Curley, first grade teacher, Yarmouth resident. Um, like all of my colleagues, I so want to be back in school. Um, remote learning is less than ideal for all of us. I want to be back there guiding my children, watching them grow, facilitating that growth. Um, hygiene is my biggest, biggest fear. Um, I did send something to the superintendent, Mr. Jenks, and the school committee. Mr. Jenks was very kind to respond very quickly and assure me that things were, were in place. Um, my greatest fear is that our buildings and our buses are not gonna be cleaned properly. Um, they need to be cleaned first, then sanitized. So this is kind of like doing the whole building twice. Um, same thing, are the buses gonna be cleaned in between routes? Who's doing that? Who's sanitizing it between routes? Um, it requires a lot of trust. Um, again, uh, I'm going to echo what Kendra said, um, our, our buildings were filthy. Um, my carpet was rarely cleaned. Um, occasionally they took a broom and swept it. Um, my, I taught my children, um, to help me sweep the floors daily. That was one of our daily tasks because it wasn't being done by the district. Um, we have to trust, um, that, parents are doing their part. And Ms. Woodbury, if I can uh, 
steal your um, phrase from our task force meeting today, um, personal responsibility. We have to trust that parents are mo truly monitoring their children in the morning, um, checking for symptoms of illnesses and not giving them Tylenol or cold med, sending them in and hoping for the best. Um, that worries me and that is past practice. Uh, we have to trust that um, if our nurse identifies someone who's presenting with COVID sy symptoms and that child is sent home, that that parent is going to take that child to their pediatrician or doctor um, and hopefully get a test. It's not mandatory, it's optional. And I know those tests are expensive. Um, and that's going to be a problem for a lot of our parents. Um, meanwhile, the, while that child is home quarantining and we have no test, I know myself, I'll be worried the whole time, that two week period, have I been exposed? Am I exposing others? Am I taking this home with me? Um, it's a lot of trusting. There's a lot of anxiety around this. I know everyone's working really hard. I agree with Mr. Fitzgerald um, on the task force and I'm sure other committees that I'm completely unaware of. Everybody's worked really hard and I know safety is, is in the forefront, but we're still playing Russian roulette here. Thank you. Dan Springer. Thank you. Um, a lot of what I was uh, thinking about has already been said, but I just wanted to leave the committee with two, two points. Um, the first, um, actually, Mrs. Woodbury, um, you, you sort of articulated one of my concerns is that every time you look at one of these simple um, solutions, like let's take our class outside, I know my colleagues and I are thinking, wait, we're going outside? Okay, do they have their hats? Do they have sunscreen? Uh, if we're in the sun, are there kids that are, have allergies, so stuff blowing in the wind is going to bother them? Who needs their EpiPen? Do I have to have an EpiPen with me? Do I get a radio? Um, each, each little thing that sounds like, well, that's a great idea. Let's just go outside as long as the weather's nice, is very complicated when you look at our population of students. And, um, you know, this is, this is a time to be cautious if there ever was a time to be more cautious, this is certainly it. Um, so that's one point I wanted to make. The other point I wanted to make is, is there seems to be a lot of concern, a lot of talk about social emotional growth and, and these kids haven't seen their friends and they haven't been in school. The, the construct for what school will be is, is sort of a nightmare. Um, you know, we're talking about six feet apart. We're talking about a mask covering faces. Um, you know, I have, I have students with, with issues with understanding emotion. Now they won't even see most of my face if I'm, if I'm in school trying to teach them. So to me, remote is the advantage because at least they can see all of me, all of my face and see whether I'm teasing or smiling or, or getting frustrated or, and I can see the same in their faces. So is it ideal? No, but we're all facing something here we've never faced before. And I wonder if we went back and looked at 1918, um, you know, what, I can imagine people looking at our conversations and saying, are you people being ridiculous? Of course, you don't want to cluster all these kids together. That's a very dangerous thing to do. So um, I thank all my colleagues for their comments. And um, those are pretty much the things that I, I had been thinking about that I wanted to say. Uh, remote is the way to go. Even if, it's, even if we plan down the road that maybe kids can come back in a limited fashion like Barnes is doing, I think upfront what we need to do is make sure we have our remote plans in place for real education. That's what we should be spending our professional development time doing so that no matter what happens, whether things get better, that's great, then wonderful, then we don't need it. But what if things don't? I mean, we're talking about getting into flu season. Dr. Fauci just warned everybody about flu shots. Um, are we gonna do something to make sure our kids are all vaccinated? Because they're saying if you get the flu and COVID, which you can get together, it's a deadly combination. So, um, you know, Nobody likes this. It's not the great a solution, but it's a safe solution. 
And again, uh, the, the, the comments about community, I think are really valid here. If we are not together, we will destroy each other. Thank you. Leanne Kumansellis, please. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging me. Um, I have a few points that I would like to bring up um, that I know that some of my colleagues have brought up as well, but I think that things need to be reiterated. Um, I have been teaching in this district for over 27 years, or I'm approaching my 28th year. Um, and I am a proud to be a dentist resident and a teacher in DY, but I am very um, cautious about returning fully to school. I don't feel as though we are in a position to say that we are able to protect everyone who is ready to go to school. I don't feel as though um, so many questions that we have have been answered. I can speak for myself. I know that we don't have windows that open at Wixon. Um, I have less, fewer than three windows that open. Um, I do not have cross ventilation of any kind where I am in the building. Um, I purchased my own HEPA air filter and uh, it's a Honeywell little product that filters out the air. The screens, the filters have to be replaced at least once a month because they are full, so full of debris that the machine shuts off. The cleaning in our building has been less than um, stellar. The rugs don't get vacuumed. We have students that, vac that um, sweep for us at the end of the day. We have supplied our own Lysol and Clorox wipes for years to make sure that our rooms are clean. I worry about myself. I worry about my fellow teachers. I worry mostly about my students and their health in um, coming back to school. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Megan, Mc Megan McFall, please. Um, good evening. My name is Megan McFall. I'm a Yarmouth resident, a parent of two students in the DY district and a teacher at Station Avenue. I'm speaking to you tonight in regards to the cleaning regimen that has been proposed in your plan. In your plan, you cite standard cleaning routines, which include a daily wiping of down of tables, chairs, and other surfaces, emptying trash, cleaning restrooms, vacuuming, and cleaning floors. As it has previously been said by other teachers, these practices don't always happen. In fact, rarely happen. I'm happy to hear that it will happen with greater frequency. However, I'm concerned it will not be daily as it should be. In my experience, students' desks and chairs are only cleaned when done so by teachers, not custodial staff. Last year, there was chocolate milk on my floor. I left it there to see when and if my floors might get mopped. It was there for three weeks. I find that thorough cleaning does not happen unless done so by teachers. It saddens me to think that it's taken a pandemic for these changes to happen. I'm optimistic that the district will be monitoring daily cleaning, although I cannot end without saying I'm fearful of what might happen if they don't. Thank you. Carol Pimentel, please. Thank you. I'm Carol Pimentel, and I've been teaching kindergarten in the Dennis District for 24 years. I love my job, I love my children, and I love my families. Um, and it makes me sad to think that I might not be able to see a new group of students this year. However, I'm not even gonna address the cleaning issues because so many other teachers from my building have. I've reported on numerous times how filthy the classroom is and how it hasn't been taken care of, but I'm gonna move past that. I'm gonna get onto the social emotional needs of my kindergartners. My kindergartners are looking forward to coming to school. They wanted to walk into a classroom that's full of fantasy and imagination and play. And all I see is a classroom with desks lined up in rows, no carpet, where we have our morning meeting, where we share the news, where we learn about each other, where we build community, where we take risks, 
we learn, learn, use our oral language skills, all these things develop. Those things aren't gonna be there anymore. They're gonna be sitting at a table. They're gonna look at a friend like this. They're not, I mean, how am I gonna to get to know my students? I'm not even gonna know what their faces look like. Then I think about the importance of play. I took a class this summer about the importance of play for young children. It was approved by the district. Now I have no play. What are my students gonna do? They learn through play. They don't have the language to communicate with each other. They communicate through play. They find things that they have in common. They learn about each other. They realize that other people feel the same way they do. It's all those things that we're missing out on. They're not getting those, those experiences if they're not able to play with a friend. I don't even know if I can put Legos on a table and let a student use them or am I gonna have to clean everything that they're exposed to. I just don't know why like, there's so many unanswered questions. You know, I have this crazy idea that maybe kindergarten could start later than the other grades only because they've had some experience. They know what it used to look like and they know that it's gonna be different. But my kindergartners are gonna to come to school and they're gonna sit at that table and they're gonna wait for the next round of students to come in on the next bus. And that could be, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes later. And they come in and then they sit at a table. And then the next round come in, comes in on the next bus. And they could be sitting for 10 or 15 minutes. And you know what? I envision tears. I envision kids who are sad, who are crying, who want their moms. They're not happy. School's no fun. And, and I know, I, I don't blame them. And I could imagine parents just trying to get them on the bus the next day. They're not going to want to come. What am I supposed to do with my little friends who fall and have a boo-boo. I keep first aid in my classroom to save the nurse from all that tedious little stuff. Can I put a band-aid on them? Can I get that close to them? When I have a child who doesn't feel well, I want to check their temperature. Can I do that? What do I just keep sending everybody to the nurse for little things that she's already overwhelmed in? I mean, our nurse was missing lunch every day last year because of so much going on in the office. We, it, it, it's just, I, you know, I just, I mean, I'd love to see my kids. I'd love a smaller class size. What a beautiful thing. 12 kids. But thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Ellen Redmond. Hi, thanks, Carol. Um, Mary Ellen Redmond, I'm a teacher uh, at Maddox's and I'm a dentist re uh, resident. <clears throat> I would love more than anything to be back in my classroom in September with all my students. But because we're in the midst of a pandemic with a virus that's highly transmissible and one that we're still learning about, I have to support the phased in approach similar to Barnstable's. Beginning with two weeks remote with our vulnerable populations going into the building, getting their footing, followed by uh, maybe a, a couple weeks of half days for kids, full for teachers, and then you know, full in-person teaching and learning if it's safe at that point. By then in October, the summer population hopefully will have dwindled, present less risk, risk of infection. Uh, this is a cautious and prudent approach and that is what we need to take. There is just too much risk here for everyone. We need to proceed slowly and carefully into the full in-person uh, education. Thank you. Aaron Porter, please. Uh, how did it work out? Uh, thank you, Carol. Aaron Porter. Um, I've been a teacher in the district for over 30 years, and I'm currently teaching at Station oh, nice. Avenue. Um, I concur with the things <laughs> that my colleagues said prior to me about concerns with cleanliness and concerns with safety within the buildings upon yeah, our right. return, and um, agree that a phased in approach that's been used to open restaurants, businesses throughout the uh, Commonwealth seems to be the um, successful. And I would think that would be our best plan of action moving forward. Um, in addition, I have a couple of questions about um, issues that really impact teacher social and emotional well being, um, primarily communication. Um, will there be a time? when teachers will be invited to a forum. I heard that there would be a parent forum coming up. Um, clearly you, you see tonight that there's many concerns amongst our teachers 
And this is really the first opportunity that people have had to express those concerns and only because they came to a school committee meeting. Um, will we have that opportunity to have a forum to continue these conversations in, in, in a less limited fashion than three minutes um, each in a 30 minute time frame? Um, and in addition, when will this, the staff, the teachers, the assistants, um, and all of our employees be notified as to really what their roles will be moving forward? There is some rumblings here and there that people will be reassigned, people will be moving classrooms, um, materials we've moved out of classrooms, but we've really heard that only through the grapevine. There's been very little communication, um, nothing from the task force. Um, and I'm just wondering when will we be put in the loop so we can make informed decisions about what we need to do for our health and safety and our families. Thank you. Colleen Ladd, please. And Colleen, you'll have to be the last one because we've run out of time. Are you on the line, Colleen? Yes, I'm sorry. I was just unmuting myself there. Um, I, you know, instead of echoing a lot of the comments that people have already said, I just want to highlight um, some things at the high school. I am a teacher at the high school here. Um, and if the district is planning an in-person return to school, which would be hybrid at the high school level, I just urge you to think about our high school kids who are a part of our working community. And in terms of science and transmission of the virus, a 17 year old is the same as an adult. And these kids are the restaurant workers, the lifeguards, the grocery store employees. And a phased in approach would allow us a few weeks of assurance on the far side of Labor Day to help us out and practicing a little bit of extra caution, especially with this age group could have a significant impact on the success or failure of an in-person return for the entire district. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. I'm turning it over to our chair at this point. Thank you. Um, I'm a little disappointed that we had no comments from parents. I, so we heard from 14 teachers and zero parents. So oh. unfortunate. Mr. Uh, Fitzgerald. Oh, sorry. There was a parent. I'm a parent. Okay, sorry, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Sorry. One parent. So that's not. It has been one to speak. There was more than one. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. also a parent and I wanted I'm to sure speak too. There are plenty of us parents that want to speak. Too. Maybe you should open the forum minutes. for another 30 minutes. That'll be for another I'm 30. a parent with a question also. I said it was going to be 30 minutes. I'm sorry. Everyone now. I'd like to say something also. I'm a parent. Yeah, me too. Well, I mean, you could be as sorry as you want, you but if you open the meeting another 30 minutes, it seems like there's a lot of parents out there that have something to say. The teachers took up all the time. I'm sorry. We're moving on. That's very unfair of you to say that. If we had known that you would like parents to speak, then you would have given parents. Unfair. That is Complete. very unfair of you to say that. Completely unfair. Completely disagree with this decision. We're moving on to school committee business. This is our business. This is very important. The next item on the agenda is school committee business. Parents' okay. comments are important for the business. A parent, and I'm done with this meeting. What page is the calendar on in the package? Does everybody have it? I've got it on page 25 in my packet. I think it should go on record that you did not allow the parents to speak. Yes, the calendar that, that you have in front of you um, has a um, 12 uh, days prior to the start of the student year with the student year starting on the 16th of September. Uh, it takes into account the 10 days given to us by the commissioner, two additional PD days that the district uh, typically would have in a conversation uh, during some collective bargaining this week, 
um, this was also endorsed by um, the union representatives there. I move the revised calendar moving forward. All right, discussion on the calendar, please. All right, discussion on the calendar, please. So, welcome to the meeting. Just a follow-up in terms of the two calendars. Just a follow-up in terms of the two calendars that I have. And subtle victories. Subtle differences for voting on one. Before voting on one, they have the same title. So, uh, are we looking at the one that has the September 16th as, as a regular day or the first, first day of school, school for students would be the 16th. For the teachers um, and staff would work the August 25, 26, 27, September 1, 2, 3, 8, 9, 10, and 11, 13, and 14 for students and on the 20th, 14 and 15, sorry. 14 and 15, sorry. Yes. Yes, it would be much easier to read as a visual room. What is your recommendation for? What is your recommendation for? Lay it out based on. No, either way, whatever happens with with the plans or anything else going forward. Um, I would recommend that we put those 12 days uh, at the beginning of the year for staff and all the kinds of work that we need to do with staff to get ready for the school year. We are required by the commissioner to put the 10 days prior to the start of the student year. It was also the... Um, it was also the, the commissioners, um, uh, the commissioners, uh, I guess, trying to look for the right word, but he wanted to to right to word, required us to start school with students by the 16th. And I also add that uh, we have to meet with Recommendation that we passed, very similar to what we're discussing here in terms of school days, the range of number of students is enormously different from the school district, but the on the other hand, the needs, the complication, and the seriousness of this is no less between our districts and our boards. So the uh, so the um, school for students two weeks school students two weeks after we normally yes we would have started um, with our yes, students on the second started, of September um, with our students on the second of September right that's so that is two weeks do you want to turn the channel you can right. doesn't matter what noise is on here. Okay. Further discussion on the calendar. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Also, if you have the report tonight, all the recommendations are on page 43, if it makes it easier. Basically, this gives uh, 
this gives the school up to three weeks to make the necessary arrangements to substitute the school from remote learning. A lot of that brand new that you talked about before, you know, we have to make sure that there's a desk in the classroom for this returning student and that they're not added to a bus route if need be and how that's going to work and all that good stuff. So, anyone want to get recommendations? Move to approve, approve return to in school model after being in remote model as presented. There's second. Second. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Brian Sullivan. So we're, this is the kids that chose the remote model and then for whatever reason decided maybe I should go back. I don't want to go back. It would be allowed back immediately if possible or up to three weeks. They'll be brought back as soon as the logistics yeah. can be handled. We're, we really want to, if they want to, if they want to come back, we want to get them in. Okay. But the reality of it is, there may be some logistics as as more and more people return, it could get tight. Yeah, absolutely. Will the committee entertain a question about special needs students? All right, I'm going to do a roll call vote just to make this easier. Everybody in the house just wants to do whatever. So, uh, Joe Lynn. Aye. Phil Morris. Aye. Phil Morris. Aye. Good night, Aye. Aye. Frank Harris. Aye. Aye. And all of us. Thank you. Thank you. You right. may not think you're muted, but I think they're muted. They probably don't. Approval of the reopening plan as presented. Um, Just reset our text. Again, we're not approving any gritty details of this. So what we're approving is, and Chair, would you like me to summarize? Um, basically, what you're approving is allowing students, uh, families who would like them to come to school in person in kindergarten through grade seven to be allowed to do that. And students in preschool and um, grades eight through 12 to return in person through a hybrid model. Hybrid, and again, that means part of the time in person and part of the time remote. Um, with a plan for all students across the board for any family who chooses it. Move to approve the Dutch Cameron School reopening plan as presented. Second. Discussion. Excuse me, one more, Madam Chair. Would you mind um, if um, Mr. Carey, would you read? Um, the whole thing, because I think it's important to say as presented subject to collective bargaining and all of that, if you don't mind, sir. It's on page 43 at the top. I had my fucking. The yeah. school committee adopt the fall reopening plan as presented, et cetera. I'm sorry. I yeah, they probably have muted everything. It's very so. important. Not the whole page, just number one. Um, I would just say I'm, I move that the school committee adopt and then read okay. the rest of it, please. Gotcha. The superintendent. School committee. The school I committee recommend I move. adopting the I move. The school committee. I got it. Got it. <laughs> sorry. Stop cutting me off. Sorry. I'm sorry. The school committee adopt the following. I move the school committee adopt the following reopening plan as presented subject to any collective bargaining obligation and with the understanding that the situation is fluid and changes to the plan can and will be made as needed based on health data. So that is a motion that's made, been made and seconded. Um, and right. Yeah, I, you know, um, considering public comment and, and I really, I think we should consider further public comment after we vote if there's a few people that would like to address the committee and if they are bringing up something new um, i'd be okay with that one thing i want to state is we are giving parents the option of sending their students to school but we're also giving parents to do remote learning and i think that's a very big piece that might be or could be being washed over we'll see how it goes this is just we have a month 
before we are actually going to have anybody in our buildings. Things could change sometime day to day that can change considerably in a month. So I would ask for patience as we move forward with this. Thank you. So the, the collective bargaining might be mentioned that because it is who are these board members? Are they all the teachers yeah. spoke earlier? Um, they have a voice uh, discussion with their leadership, and uh, not that we're not listening to. At least I'm not trying yeah. to speak to everything that they said. They took it all into account because we uh, we respect our teachers, and uh, I don't think anybody yeah. else felt that. Uh, their sincerity, their honesty. Uh, uh, you'll drop the all that information is important. Um, Can you hear us kissing? We're, we're tied as a policy. We're, we're tied. And we can't uh, negotiate those things. Those are going to be done through negotiations. And, and uh, correct me if I'm going to have a, a, a MOU, a, a memorandum of understanding. Um, and so we're going to have that. Um, so I, I am concerned about those parents uh, that feel the need to speak. I think that communication through all of this is going to be important, that we're all going to be, we, we need to understand where everybody's coming from. And I don't think it's venting. I don't think it's uh, misleading at all for, for the people to want to communicate it because we need to know it. And as uh, the, the, the chair said earlier, that there's a lot of information that needs to be Determined, um, and as Brian Perry said earlier, um, the, about the sports and the extracurriculars, that, that those are out of our hands. Uh, us as a policy can be body, though we have to get as much information as we need, and, and we welcome that. And, and I think the, the, the superintendent and, and the district itself um, welcomes more of that. We understand that things are going to change. I want the information from the people, that's where our solution is. The devil's in the details in this, but the solutions are in the communication and, and how everybody gets uh, to cooperate. We're, we're trying to create a culture here that it, it's new to all of us, and we've got to create that culture in the school, no matter when that happens, however we, we vote, and whatever practicalities that, that uh, happen upon us. All of this is not our control. Um, we are, and one thing that I do want to mention is in regards to the funding that we set as a, as a board. And if there's if there's nothing else, the community, the teachers, the parents, this uh, school committee, if there's nothing else we agree upon, we should agree upon the fact that we stood up and we're telling our elected officials and telling the people that you're not going to, you're, you're setting these deadlines. We're not putting deadlines on, on them. We're, we're uh, doing our best and we're having deadlines and mandates put upon us. We need everybody, teachers, parents, the community, to do it because this budget is passed. Old town meetings approved it. This budget is where we are. We have to line up what our original goals are and go forward now. But our budget is set. So in this year, the towns can help out however they want to help out, but we can't go back on this budget. So I just want to make sure that that, that, that collective bargaining piece is, is in there, that we are listening uh, to the extent that we can, but those are going to be negotiated. Thank you. Bill Morris. Thank you. The opportunity to listen is paramount. Uh, and I noticed through MASC and the members of the collaborative board of directors, the, the, the basically, this conversation is being held over and over again. Uh, and one of the things that I hope to add to understanding is we, we don't have a lot of good choices, if any of them, other than taking care of the safety and the education of the kids and the safety of the staff and listening to the parents. But we are also members of the two towns and we've been supported well we just need to develop some ways of communicating this so the transparency is just a word. Thank you. Grant Hill. I bear with me here. I'm still um, 
winding down from being wound up. Um, so I think it's important to recognize the fact that all of us feel that safety is most important. However, the data in Yarmouth and Dennis do not indicate that it is unsafe for the kids to attend school. As a matter of fact, if you check both towns' websites, you'll find that there's four people in both of our towns that currently have tested positive. Out of 35,000 or so people, plus summer residents, maybe we're at 50,000 people, four people currently have the virus. So let's keep in mind that you can't catch the virus from somebody that doesn't have the virus. So it's not necessarily unsafe for our kids to go to school because very few people have the virus. Now, we don't know who those folks are. My guess is that um, they're not children, but I don't know for certain. Um, my daughter has been working with kids at Black Swan now all summer long, and they've had no issues. So I feel very confident in saying that school will be safe. Um, I certainly understand why parents and staff are scared because for the past however many months, every single day, on every news channel, the governor and the news media have been scaring people to death, literally. And that's an unfortunate thing that we have to try to walk back and say to people, okay, we scared you to the point where you won't even talk to your friends but it's okay to send your children to school. And maybe this, at the state level, they could have taken a little more initiative and stopped scaring people um, every day, but they have. So now we're left with the job of trying to reassure folks that we're gonna do the best to protect their most precious asset, which is the kids. Um, I'm 100% behind getting the kids back into school for a new a bunch of different reasons. Six months out of school, like Mr. Jenks said, is an eternity for some of these kids. A lot of kids, you know, in their minds, I mean, you know, maybe you're only five years old. That's, that's a significant part of your life. So six months is, is too long for them to be out of school. I do not like remote learning at all. Um, I hope that in the future it does never become part of anything we do. Um, I, mean, I think it is um, detrimental to the kids' education. Um, I, as I'm looking at the screen of um, folks that were talking here in public comment, I can only imagine a seven-year-old looking at the screen and, and what they would think. Um, that's not education, that's not learning in my eyes. Education is peer-to-peer, -peer, it's hands-on, it's uh, you know, explore, exploration. You're not exploring anything. To be honest with you, when I was that age, I would have looked at the iPad for about four minutes a day, and that was in the end of my education. So um, I'm 100% behind this plan, and um, hopefully, before the we run out of PPE, there'll be a vaccine, and we can put all of this emotions behind us because I for one am tired of it. Uh, I want to be back to normal, not a new normal, 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 and uh, with any luck, we can have that. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I too also had to wait a little bit before I could speak because I'm just, I'm just amazed that you know, we got we got word from a lot of the teachers of their concerns, and I, and I hear their concerns, and I understand their concerns. Um, you know, a lot of the concerns were things that happened in the last year about sanitary and stuff like that. You know, wouldn't have ever brought to, the, to this border you know, to the community members, is what I understand. Um, you know, my daughter works up at the, as an ER nurse or a nurse on the North Shore. Um, for the past six months, she's been tasked with the COVID care. Um, and she hasn't got it. And I'm not saying that she fully convinced that she probably will get it. Um, but one of the things that I asked her about was the fact that why don't you think you contracted it yet? She said the PPE, the protective equipment and sanitary atmosphere that they are put into to keep staff away. So we are we are doing it. We're, you know, the, the 
students are going to be six feet apart. The students are going to wear, and the teachers are going to wear masks or shields. The rooms are going to be sanitized daily, either by either wiping things down or with a sprayer. In every school, every school has a sprayer. So those classrooms will get sprayed down and disinfected every day. Okay. Um, you know, yes, this is a this is a terrible pandemic we're going through. And I think, you know, with the right precautions, as Governor Baker said it, with the right precautions, we will stay in that right direction. When we have parties of hundred people all gathered together with no masks is when these issues arise, and that's what you're seeing in California and Florida. Um, I think if we, we do it the right way, and we make sure that we hold our, our um, staff and our custodians and our teachers and our parents you know, to, to make sure that if they're sick, they get home. Okay? If you don't feel safe, then do it remote. And that's one of the good things I, I like about this recommendation said, offer full in-person for any family that wishes this model. So if you want to have your student at home for remote learning, then you can do that. You can do that. There are a lot of families out there that are working, the parents, it's a one-parent family, and they're working two jobs to pay the mortgage for food on the table, and they have to go to work. They don't have the luxury of a, a keeping a second grader home all day long by themselves. They don't have babysitters. They can't afford daycare, things like that. So you know what? If we can give our students the best safe environment to learn in, that's what we do. That's what we need to do. That's really this this um, plan, this recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. When I came here this evening, to be honest with you, I have concern about the virus. I think safety is a major concern. I think a lot of people who spoke tonight emphasize their concern about safety. I'm satisfied with the plan that's presented because people, parents definitely have a choice. If they want their child, or they have to have their child in school, whatever the case may be, they're sending, they can send them parent wants to keep the child at home, they have that choice. And uh, I also hope and believe that there's a lot of flexibility in this proposal. And if things change, we'll adjust the course. Thank you. So I'm sure some will vilify me for public comment and not taking further comment. But I don't think anybody can accuse me of not being a listener and not listening to parent concerns. Over the past couple of weeks, I have had three, if not four, Zoom office hours to allow parents during the two hours to come to me with their concerns. Some parents did participate teachers and constantly boosting and putting out their my school page, my own personal Facebook page, my email address, my phone number is out there. There are multiple ways to contact me and tell me your concerns. And I'm still listening. And we're all listening after tonight. And whether or not we pass this recommendation tonight doesn't mean that something couldn't change in the next few weeks. And we're going to constantly keep safety at the top of the list and make sure that concerns are addressed. I did not know concerns by teachers about classrooms at night. Nobody has ever brought that to public comment or emailed that to me or told me about that before. And I'm sorry that we talked to someone in administration and not addressed, but I believe we have very different administration. And if those concerns are brought, they will be approved. I wasn't aware. So now we know, and that's something that we can work on. And correct, not just work on, but that's something we can correct. It's something we have to correct, and we will. There are a lot of hats. Um, I speak not only as a school committee member, obviously, a resident dentist, but a parent of a child going into sixth grade. What I've said to everyone, and I'll say it again 
tonight is I wouldn't make a decision and I'm not going to make a decision for this that I don't feel all safe for my own student who also has a health condition and causes him to be depressed. He will be going to school wearing a mask and a shield. And he is taking time to get used to wearing a mask and he will be getting used to a shield. He's already using hand washing and hand sanitizer and six foot distancing. We're all going to be as careful as we can. Um, we're not Barnstable, we're not born, we're not Wareham, we're not Lemon Stir, we're DY. We know what we can do with our buildings, we know what we can do with our programs. I don't like to the district. We're all working hard to do why and to make this as safe as we can and to best up the do why that we can. So our plan is flexible, it's adaptable. We can go from one day to the next, go from in person to remote, down overnight. That's a possibility. The kids are going to be prepped for that. Confident that the district principals or our staff and parents over the next few weeks to get those plans in place and that we have plenty of professional development time built into the beginning of the year for teachers technology training they need for us to work out the sanitation protocol and our procedures. So I probably already said too much. Anybody else? Our next school committee meeting is when? I mean, yeah, we have to take a vote on that. Yep. Okay. Um, so we have a motion. No further discussion. I'm going to take a roll call vote on this. Bill Glenn. Aye. Bill Morris. Yes. Brian Sullivan. Yes. Tim Dykeman. Yes. Brian Carey. Yes, with the hope that we'll revisit it if we have to. Of course. Yes. Joe Tierney is a yes. I'm a yes. Thank you. Now, the task force is going to continue working. The administrator. We have another tentative date on the calendar for the task force, depending on how things go in the next week. The administration has to prepare this final, for this report in final shape to be submitted. Um, the conversation doesn't stop. So I hope everybody remembers that and it will make changes as needed. So, um, Carol, do you have anything else? No. All right, that's everything on the agenda for today. Go. Our right, next meeting. Oh, sorry, yes. I'm sorry. Right, you said that. I forgot to answer that. Okay, fine. The next meeting, right on the calendar, is Monday the 17th. Correct. If we need for some reason to meet sooner, we will let everybody know, but that gives us time to get the report submitted, to have some feedback. The one more task force meeting to come back to this committee. And we're also planning those forums. Anybody can attend these forums, parent, teacher, they're intended to answer people's questions. We will not, however, be using these forums to do union negotiations. So that's, let me make that clear. Um, and those will certainly happen. So, anything else? Kim, just on, on the calendar going forward, obviously I'm not familiar with how you set up the yearly calendar. Does that come out at a later date? We're going to be putting together, we, put it, we do a year, a year's worth of dates. With the understanding that they change sometimes depending on scheduling issues, but that will be coming up shortly. Okay. Yeah, okay. Usually in the summer, we meet twice. So right. this is not the okay. All right, anything else? All right. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion